The Great Tribulation Timeline. This is a presentation about the Great Tribulation, and it's really, um, I have not seen anything like this, and it's, I've got quite a lot to cover. But this is a study of scripture that mentions periods of times and end time prophecy. So it's about the length of the Great Tribulation and, and the events of the Great Tribulation. Um, um, now, there's periods of time described in the Bible, and our, our modern calendar system is days, weeks, months, and years. But we see different ways of uh, time described in the Bible. Um, in Daniel chapter 9, there's the famous 70 weeks, and we see weeks of years. And most scholars agree that those are weeks of years. And so we want to know how can we tell that these periods of times are actually what, what we think they are. And so what they've done is they've taken Leviticus 25 verse 8 and they've seen that there's a, there is such a thing as a week of years. But how do we really know this for sure? And this is where, I, where I'm going to come in and introduce some, um, some concepts here. So how do we confirm that this is really seven years? And so um, this is a verse, Daniel 9.25, that talks about a prediction that Daniel uh, makes in here of the coming of Christ. So this prediction has been fulfilled. So we know that this is weeks of years based on um, the fulfillment of this scripture. And so we know that's how we, that's one way we can confirm it. But there's other ways here. Um, and so what I want to do is talk about the time periods in the Bible. Uh, they're not just symbolic. So what you do is compare scripture from scripture Scripture with Scripture. And so um, the reason why I'm telling you this is that I think that if I were to, you know, if you were in the middle of the tribulation or something and you want to know how long you had to go, I, um, you would want to know perfectly. You want to really understand this. So um, I think that I'm going to show how it repeats. Uh, I'll have to kind of bear with me on this. But if I told you 42 months, you could calculate to, that to be three and a half years, okay? And so you can also tell in number of days, like 1,277 days is a year. So um, the biblical year is a little bit different, but we can kind of get an idea. So how else can we be sure of these periods of time? Well, um, if they're described in different ways, if you've said both, you've described that same period of time both in days and in years and weeks of years, wouldn't that confirm that that is the correct period of time? So that's what I'm going to find in Scripture. So we're talking about the Great Tribulation, so this is an important period of time. And so this is really also an exciting period of time, because it's a time that Jesus Christ comes back after this period. If you're to have to endure through this tribulation, would you uh, think it's important to study Scripture regarding this period of time? So, it's really important, don't you think, that God also would make sure that you're able to find out how long this period of time. Well, this is the good news. I believe that God has done this. I believe God has shown this period of time very clearly in Scripture. It's just a matter of studying it and finding it for yourself. And He's done this by repeating these times. And He's done it by giving in different way, different time periods. And that is by days, months, years, or times, and seven-year periods or weeks. So, these times are repeating the book of Daniel and also uh, Revelation. So isn't that great that we can look at these periods of time and say, wow, we can see it from different perspectives. So um, I don't have much time at all. I'm trying to keep this as much as I, as I can. So read this, um, watch this video again. I'm going to blurt all this stuff right before you really quickly. It's got a lot of information. But just compare prophecy to prophecy, and you're going to see what's similar about them, and you're going to be able put the pieces of puzzle together. There's actually quite a lot of information there about the end times. Um, so here's a first example of these periods of time, and it's a time, times, and the dividing of time. And that would equal up to three years. There's another one, 2,300 days. Now, I think that might have been a transcript error or copyist error of some kind. It might actually mean 1,300 days, but I'll go into that later. Here's another example, Dan, Daniel 9.27, and it says a week, which is seven years, but also mentions a midst of a week. That's three and a half years. So I'm seeing this repeating pattern of three and a half years. 
At Daniel 12, there's also another time, times and a half of time, and that also adds up to three and a half years. We see this repeating over and over. So take down these scriptures and see what they're saying and compare them. Um, and so now, at Daniel 12, it has another period of time, 1290 days and 1335 days. Both are about three and a half years of time. Now in Book of Revelation, we see similarities to the Book of Daniel prophecy, and then new periods of time are introduced, like months. So we'll see months in there. It's really amazing to see how many times I've, it's like an Easter egg hunt for me to find all these different um, periods of time. So here's one that's 42 months in Revelation 13.5, and in Revelation 11 it shows both 42 months, which is 35, three and a half years, and it shows uh, 1,290 days, which is another three and a half years. And these all relate back to this book of Daniel. So then here's another part that's talking about the woman fleeing into the wilderness for 1,203 score days. And then there's another time where the woman is given wings of an eagle, and there's a time, times, and half a time in Revelation. That's three and a half years. Just keeps repeating over and over and over. Could all these periods be re relating to describe the same thing? Well, that's where we need to compare scriptures. One thing we see in common is this abomination that brings desolation, a period of time related to that. So let's go into the abomination that brings desolation. Here it is mentioned by uh, Jesus in Matthew 24, and he mentions uh, Daniel the prophet. So um, Jesus talks about this. So here it is, this time of period of about 2,300 days and 2,000, uh, 1,290 days, both mention this abomination of desolation. And then we saw, I noticed that there is a difference of a thousand days, but like I said, I suspect that's just copious error between those two. So one says 2,300 days in Daniel 8, 14. The other one, Daniel 12, 11, says 1,290 days. I have a feeling that that's just a copious error. I don't have any way of proving that, though. That's just my theory. You're going to have to decide. Fortunately, we got enough scripture to back up um, this theory, okay? So here's Daniel 9.27. Again, we see this abomination of desolation in Daniel 9.27. And it's also in the midst of a week. That's three and a half years. Daniel 7.25 talks about the beast be, being given power. Um, he shall be given. They shall be given into his hand until time, times, and a dividing of times. Now if you compare this to Revelation 13, it shows that the power is given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. There's another three and a half year period of time. It's amazing. I keep finding this over and over. A uh, court of sanctuary is trodden underfoot. There's another concept that the, the um, sanctuary is trodden underfoot in Daniel 8, 13. And it's also um, this period of time. Well, this one says 2,300 days. Like I said, it could be 1,300 days, which is about three and a half years. And then also in Revelation 11, it talks about the court um, being tread underfoot for 42 months. And then it also says he's going to give power to his two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,203 score days, another three and a half year period of time. So you see this pattern repeating over and over and over, and I don't have time to explain every verse. And here's Matthew talking about fleeing to the mountains in the verse after the, the abomination brings desolation. Well, then I find that it's talking about this woman that fled into the wilderness and she f was there for 1,203 square days, three and a half years. And then it seems like this same woman in verse 14 of Revelation 12 has been given wings of a great eel that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the face of servant. That's another three and a half year period of time. Uh, so Jesus talks about this on the Mount of Olives. And so if you study Matthew 24, you're going to see the chain of events that Jesus talks about. And it's in sections. They ask this question about what's the sign of his coming and the end of the world. And Jesus answered it. And he didn't speak this in vain. This is something that you should pay attention to. So um, um, there's different sections, and I'm going to go through them real quick. The first section is he says there's going to be deception. He says, take heed, no man deceive you. Many false Christs will come. Then he talks about this beginning of SARS. He said that there be wars and rumors of wars. But he says this, 
These things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He says, be not troubled in this verse also. That's interesting. Why would he say that? Maybe it's because he's giving you a sign that happens before the end to watch for, but not the actual end. So that you know the end is not yet. So then he says there's going to be persecution in the next section here. And then after that, he says, then he talks us about this abomination of desolation. And then the tone changes, and he says, you know, flee to the mountains. He's telling you to do something. He also says it's going to be the great tribulation after this. So first comes the abomination of desolation, then the great tribulation. And he says, from there shall be great tribulation in verse 21, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever shall be. So this is um, the great tribulation that happens after he mentions the abomination. Prior to the abomination, he doesn't mention anything about being troubled. He doesn't say the end is here, but then he's saying it kind of changes, you know. Uh, so then Jesus mentions a great tribulation out that. So now, from what I've studied, I found the great tribulation is not really a predefined period of time. However, there's a sharp increase in sorrows to the point that things are worse than they ever have been and will ever be that bad again. This is called Great Tribulation by Jesus, not the Great Tribulation. The teaching that there is a period of time called the Tribulation, I cannot find that in Scripture. Um, however, there are periods of time in Bible prophecy that correlate to this Great Tribulation that, describe, that Jesus describes. It is called the Great Tribulation in the Book of Revelation. The pattern that I see in Scripture is that the period of time is marked by an event or a chain of events that happen in a short period of time. This event that mar marks the beginning of the period is shown in Matthew 24 as the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. All the scriptures that indicate a period of time related to this event show a period of time of three and a half years. So I conclude that the tribulation period is one three and a half year period of time. So where did the idea of a seven year great tribulation come from? Well, there's like only one verse, and it's Daniel 9.27. And it doesn't mention anything about a tribulation in there. It does mention this midst of the week there will be this abomination that makes it desolate. So I, I'm, it's just agreeing with me that there's a three and a half year period of time. So I don't know what that prior period is, but um, I see much more about that latter period than the beginning period. Uh, it's very difficult to understand Daniel 9, so I can't make it as my final authority on Scripture. I have to compare other Scriptures to it. So, now, another thing I find is that um, when I read uh, Matthew 24 carefully and other parts of the Bible that mention the return of Jesus Christ, I never see anything to indicate that there is a rapture, but rather I find that there is a gathering of the elect that takes place at the time of the glorying, glorious return of Jesus Christ, and at the time of the resurrection. And I'll give you some examples. Matthew 24, he shows after the tribulation, they're going to see the sign of Son of Man. He's going to come in power and glory. And then he shall send his angel with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of one end of heaven to the other. So that happens after the tribulation in verse 29 to verse 31. And then when you look at Daniel 12, 1, it shows that the tribulation happens in um, verse 1. It says there's going to be a, a time of trouble such as was never since there was a nation, even to that same time. And so, right? Now it says this. It says, uh, the many of them that sleep in the dust earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting come. Contep, and it says, everyone and the time the people shall be delivered. So it's the, the um, there's going to be the tribulation, and then after that there's going to be the resurrection. It's just the same pattern over and over again. Um, um, so then now we kind of go into 1 Thessalonians 4, and I found that people, when they say comfort one another with these words, they think that you're supposed to comfort one another in verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians 4, you know, they say comfort one another with these words, and they say that's about comforting one another, that you're not going to go through the rapture. However, this is not a doctrine in Scripture that's talking about the rapture. Uh, uh, people escaping tribulation, nowhere is it mentioned in here. 
is a tribulation in this passage. But rather, if you look at verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, Thessalonians 4, verse 13, it says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So the reason why he says in verse 18, comfort one another with these words, is because he's saying that you're going to see your loved ones are going to be resurrected again. Um, and I, I know this is a very simplistic view, literalistic view of Scripture, and that the rapture doctrine is more sophisticated. They find other scriptures to back it up, but most of the verses are taken out of context. Okay, so I find that the non-rapture view is the most literal explanation of Scripture, and that there is no such thing, no idea in Scripture of two comings of Christ, two resurrections being taken to heaven in the rapture. It doesn't exist and are not taught in Scripture. There's no doctrine that that teaches that. What happens is these doctrines are um, from speculation and theories that are taught from pulpits. So you should study the scripture for yourself and disregard if something is taught in scripture that's contrary because there is such a thing as false teachers and false teachings out there and men's traditions. And once those traditions set in, it's very difficult to uh, to do to you know come to a uh, to come to a conclusion that is a uh, valid um, you know a valid. Um, in other words, it's it's very difficult for people to see in the scripture what really is the truth because they've been taught this for so many years that they, they can't make that hurdle. So there's things in scripture that are contrary to what you're taught. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to be like a Baran and make sure that what you've heard is not false, that you be true. And just because your pastor's a nice guy doesn't necessarily mean he understands things that well because he might have gone to seminary and got repeated the same thing that he taught. He might not have actually checked it out himself. He might have just been taught it in a classroom format. This is the way it is. And so that's what I'm finding is there's a lot of things in Scripture that people just assume that's what it's talking about, but it's not really, really there. Um, so um, we need to really make sure that we understand um, we understand things from our own perspective. And so when I see that, I find it's confirmation of Scripture. Not just one Scripture, but many things comparing each other. Now, you don't find that about the rapture. You find this and that and the other thing. So the gathering of the elect happens after the tribulation. It's not the rapture. The rapture says that the, that doctrine of the rapture says that the, the elect will be taken before the tribulation. They'll go to heaven to be with the Lord forever. But that that misses out the millennium because the millennium, when Jesus comes back, we'll be with the Lord, but we'll be on earth forever. And then after the millennium, the new Jerusalem that Jesus prepared, remember that verse that says, I go to prepare a place for you. You know, there in my Father's house there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. When he says that, what he's saying is... Um, that he's preparing the new Jerusalem for you. But the thing is, you got to follow that because he said that when he returns, you will be able to be there with him. And that place that you're going to be with him at is the new Jerusalem. And if you read in Revelation 22 or 21, it says a new Jerusalem. Yeah, it's Revelation 21. At the beginning, it says there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and that Jerusalem will descend down from heaven to earth. So the idea that Christians are going to go to heaven they go to heaven in the spirit, and that's when Jesus comes back. He's going to bring the saints with him. It says that in Thessalonians 4. The saints come with them, but that's the spirits of the saints that come with them. The resurrected body are here on earth when he comes. So they're there, and they come back. So anyway, there's a lot of web of confusion out there. But the, the takeaway from this is that I believe that there's a three-and-a-half-year tribulation, and that happens after the abomination of desolation that happens. And that, that um, a lot of people say that that's the wrath of God on man. Uh, well, it is the wrath of God, but God would not give you, you were not appointed to wrath. And in there, the, their people will be sealed. They will not face the wrath of God if you're a Christian. Now, you will face persecution and even death, possibly, if you stand for what you believe and you don't accept the mark of the beast. But that doesn't come from God. That comes from the, the beast, Antichrist. Okay. So I hope you really study this and take this seriously. I've shown you many verses that show this period of time in Scripture.